I would like to start welcoming you all to the 25th webinar of the graduate program in physics of the Federal University of Pará in Amazonia, Brazil. I ask everyone to kindly leave the cameras and microphones turned off, except for the moment you're going to speak. Questions will be allowed after the webinar, unless otherwise requested by the speaker. The questions can be asked using the chat. Today, we will have the great honor to listen to Professor John L. Friedman, who is a fellow of the American Physical Society and a former chair of its gravitational physics section. He served for several years as a U.S. representative to the International Society of General Relativity and Gravitation. Professor John Friedman received his B.A. from Harvard College in 1967 and his Ph.D. from the University of Chicago in 1973, supervised by the Nobel laureate Subramanian Chandrasekhar. From 1974 to 1976, he was a Fermi Fellow at the University of Chicago. Since 1976, he has been at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, where Friedman served for three years as chair of the Department of Physics and where he currently holds the rank of University Distinguished Professor Emeritus. Professor John Friedman is known worldwide for his contributions to theoretical astrophysics and gravitational physics, as well as for the topological censorship theorem with wheat and, and a construction with sorting of half integral spin in vacuum gravity. He has written, together with Nikolaus Sterulas, the excellent textbook titled Rotating Relativi Relativistic Stars, published in 2013 as part of the series of the Cambridge monographs on mathematical physics. Well, I need to control myself not to extend this introduction and give the voice to our distinguished speaker, thanking him once again for having accepted our invitation. Professor Friedman, thank you very much once again. The audience from this moment on is yours. Okay, well, thank you, Luis. I wanted to thank you and the organizers for including me in uh, a series that of uh, really distinguished people, so flattering to be part of this. Uh, the first detections of gravitational waves from the in spiral and merger of a double neutron star system was remarkably nearby. And as many of you know, it was accompanied by the electromagnetic detection of a burst of gamma rays, followed by a slowly fading and reddening light. The discovery quickly led to major advances in resolving 50-year-old mysteries, the source of gamma ray bursts, the size, maximum mass, and equation of state of neutron stars, uh, the origin of heavy elements, uh, and combined electromagnetic and gravitational wave observations immediately gave a model independent, although not yet precise, measurement of the Hubble constant. Uh, here are my collaborators, uh, the material I'll be talking about in a talk that focuses primarily on uh, implications for the neutron star equation of state. I have over 2,000 authors and I'll, uh, so I'll be giving almost no uh, references in the talk. We'll start with uh, a brief discussion of short gamma ray bursts and neutron star mergers talk about what is known and not known about the equation of state above nuclear density, the neutron star equation of state, and talk about how we <coughs> have uh, learned a fair amount about the equation of state from first the tidal imprint on the in-spiral waveform and <coughs> more dramatically from the post-merger ob observations that gave uh, a strong constraint on the maximum mass of neutron stars. <clears throat> Underlying these advances are a set of quick calculations. Uh, we'll look at four of them, uh, three to five minutes apiece, 
And so this part of the talk is a back of the envelope version of the part of gravitational wave astrophysics that we'll be looking at. Starting in the late 60s with a set of satellites that the United States launched to monitor the test ban treaty just signed with the Soviet Union uh, was a discovery of gamma ray bursts that had nothing to do with uh, nuclear tests and in fact uh, didn't come from the Earth, the Sun or the galaxy. <clears throat> so here you can see a burst from outside the Milky Way band. This is what light looks like when it's coming from sources that are in the galaxy, nearby sources and those farther away in our galaxy. Uh, and here's what the gamma ray bursts look like, isotropically distributed across the sky. From the isotropic distribution, people uh, conjectured that they were cosmological and the cosmological origin was confirmed when host galaxies were found for several of the bursts. From the uh, large distance, the large redshift of the host galaxy, uh, you could get the energy of these events and they turned out to be the brightest electromagnetically observed events in the universe, ranging up to 10 to the 54 ergs a thousand times the energy emitted by the sun in its 10 billion year lifetime. There are two classes of the bursts, short bursts and long, and you can see that there's a, a dividing line uh, with a little overlap in the middle. Uh, there's a sharp difference between the two bursts. The long gamma ray bursts are seen only in galaxies with recently formed stars, and that conforms to the identification of these bursts with the most energetic supernovae, the most luminous supernovae. So the point is that supernovae only occur in high mass stars. Stars, because they have such a high mass and they burn their nu nuclear fuel so rapidly, they live for only 50 million years, a short time for a galaxy. Uh, and so they're only seen in star forming galaxies. And on the other hand, in cases where you can identify a galaxy to which the short burst belongs, the galaxy's stars are old. So we're not looking at supernovae. But the energy of both sources is essentially the gravitational energy of a neutron star, somewhat less than that if you don't include the gravitational waves or the energy of the short bursts. Well, the energy that's emitted in the collapse of a dwarf or the core of a star to a neutron star is the infall energy, the binding energy of the neutron star. And we can calculate that energy by first looking at the radius of a neutron star. So our first simple calculation, <clears throat> neutron stars have a mass that's comparable to the upper mass limit of white dwarfs or the degenerate core of an iron core star. Uh, a nuclear density with that mass gives a radius that's uh, 1.4 solar masses over nuclear density to the one third, and that's about 14 kilometers. The actual density of a neutron star is somewhat larger than that, although for a 1.4 solar mass neutron star, not more than about twice nuclear saturation density. And the radius is then uncertain between 9 and 14 kilometers from gravitational wave observations. Uh, electromagnetic observations in the last uh, decade have somewhat narrowed this. So 11 to 13 and a half for a uh, radius of a uh, 1.35 to 1.4 solar mass neutron star. Well, once we have the radius, uh, we can immediately calculate the gravitational binding energy. So here we have our radius sitting of the neutron star sitting over Bell M. Uh, the energy from collapse to a neutron star is then uh, mass squared over the radius, 1.4 solar masses divided by 
uh, 11 kilometers. There shouldn't be a square here. And that gives 4 times 10 to the 53 ergs. So the observed energy of gamma ray bursts is in the, is, uh, ranges up to about this, from 10 to the 48 ergs for the lowest energy uh, short bursts up to 10 to the 54 ergs for the uh, most energetic strong bursts. Uh, this is, in, the energy is uh, partly in light, but the bulk of it is in neutrinos and gravitational waves. Well, 130 million years ago, uh, a pair of neutron stars started to merge. Uh, galaxy 130 million light years away. So you have two neutron stars, each with a density in natural units of about a billion tons per teaspoon, spiraling around each other and coalescing. You can watch the in-spiral and then the coalescence. And at the end of the animation, when the stars uh, fall into each other and merge, you'll see a delay of a couple of seconds and then a jet emerging from there uh, with most of the gamma rays concentrated in the jet. So 130 million years later, uh, in August of 2017, the gravitational waves from this event were detected by the LIGO-Virgo collaboration. And then two seconds later, there, that was it. Uh, so two seconds, let's do it one more time. From that two second interval and the gravitational waves, well, from the waves, you can deduce that uh, you were looking at two neutron stars, each with a mass of about 1.4 solar masses. From the glow hours after the collision, a galaxy was identified and the redshift gave you a distance of about 130 million light years. That immediately gives you the speed of gravitational waves. The time from the end of the chirp to the gamma ray burst is less than two seconds. So even if that entire delay was unrelated to the delay for until you released the jet, uh, even if the entire delay was due to gravitational waves traveling slightly more slowly than the speed of light, a slight graviton mass, the difference in speed is limited by one part in 10 to the minus 15, 1 1.8 seconds over 130 million years. Well, that's our first cheap calculation. And now we turn to the part of the uh, astrophysics that's closest to my work, to my heart, the equation of state and the behavior of neutron stars above nuclear density. But what we know about neutron stars first is that they're cold. The, at nuclear density and above, the neutrons and the admixture of protons are packed so tightly that their Fermi energy is well above the thermal energy uh, of the star. So the equation of state is essentially that of a zero temperature, of zero temperature matter depending on only one parameter then no dependence on temperature or entropy. Essentially a zero temperature, zero entropy, rest mass configuration. So the pressure is a function only of energy density or of rest mass density, uh, a single one parameter equation of state. What's unknown about the equation of state uh, is dramatized by not knowing what the composition of the core is. So there are two difficulties. One is doing the many body theory for fermions uh, at high densities. Uh, it's just a difficult problem. So no one has a good 
no one has good many body theory. There are increasingly good uh, semi-empirical uh, equations of state for uh, neutron star matter. The other difficulty beyond this difficulty with many body theory is the uncertainty in knowing how the quarks in a neutron star are grouped and what really what the quarks are. So first, is the core dense enough to create strange quarks, to push the Fermi energy of some down quarks above the threshold to convert to strange quarks? So do you get the hyperons of the eightfold way with up, down, and strange quarks? Is the Fermi energy of the neutron pushed above the mass of the lowest mass hyperon, the lambda, so that you convert uh, a down quark to an up quark, although the way it's done is with a neutron-proton reaction, for example. Neutron-proton going to proton plus lambda, the down quark going to an up quark, and the up quark here converting to a strange quark. With a net up to down, up to strange, a net down to strange reaction. Well, if that's the case, and you have down quarks converting to strange quarks, do they group as hyperons in the core, or is the core itself dense enough that the nuclei overlap and dissolve into just strange quark matter, a large bag of up, down, and strange quarks. And more radically, although less likely, is the true ground state of cold matter strange quark matter for any collection of nucleons larger than a few hundred quarks. Uh, well, this was a suggestion of Bodmer and then Witten, still not ruled out by nuclear theory, uh, but uh, not, not likely. So the, if this were true, it would mean that the true ground state of matter would not be iron, but would be strange quark matter at uh, several times nuclear density. You have to get the matter to that density, but if you did that, then in collision of strange quark stars, you could distribute some strangelets through the universe. <coughs> So this uncertainty in the internal structure is shown here. Possibility of up, down, and strange quarks, uh, free quarks grouped as hyperons, the possibility of absolutely strange, strange quark matter. And another thing we hadn't discussed of uh, being advantageously, ener energetically advantageous to produce quark-antiquark -quark pairs, which then uh, group as pion or kaon condensates. Uh, any of these alternatives allow you to have a phase transition at high density when you add more pressure and instead of, so add more baryons, instead of increasing the pressure, the baryons then go through this phase transition, the pressure rises only slowly until the transition is finished and that softens the equation of state at high density. And by doing that, it means that at high density, as you add mass and the pressure is not significantly increasing, the star compresses. And so the upper mass limit is reduced. You get a lower upper mass limit, and it's that that gives the strongest constraint on the alternatives for the core. Uh, here's a set of equations of state. You can see here that uh, that with these guys, the uncertainty, even at nuclear saturation density in the pressure, is a factor of about five. And that uncertainty is not significantly increased at uh, higher densities. It stays about the same. Once you have uh, a maximum mass, causality really restricts the possible equations of state. You can approximate, if you look at these equations of state in log, in, this is a log pressure, log density uh, scale. And if you look at that, they're nearly straight. You can approximate this log P versus log rho relation by piecewise linear curves. These are called piecewise polytropes to about 3% if you specify a few pressure at a few fiducial densities. That's a good way of systemizing the equation of state because 
those densities correspond to uh, observations of radius and mass uh, for neutron stars where you observe the radius and the maximum mass. So the way this works is this. For each equation of state, we've seen that the equation of state itself is one parameter, and there's a one parameter family of neutron stars. So given the number of baryons, you have a single stable star. And here's that family of stars plotted as number of baryons increases over here and central density increases. Uh, so we have central density rising until you reach a maximum mass, radius decreasing as you add baryons, then you reach a maximum mass and these guys to the left are unstable. So that's the set of baryons given an equation of state, you get a mass versus radius relation and that relation can be inverted. Uh, and the inverse construction uh, by Lindblom with Lindblom and Indic giving the most accurate inversion uh, gives you the equation of state, but the key things here are that at uh, about 1.4 solar masses, the radius is essentially determined by the pressure at uh, about twice nuclear density. So this was noted by Latimer and Prakash. And uh, then the maximum mass of the neutron star is uh, determined by the pressure at, oh, something like eight times nuclear density. But again, if you know the pressure down here, the maximum mass is uh, severely constrained in the interim by causality. If the equation of state above nuclear density is soft, then that means that the uh, pressure is low for a given density. And so the radius of the neutron star will be small, less pressure, a more compact star. Uh, if the pressure at twice nuclear density is larger, the star is less centrally condensed. Well, this is what leads to the tidal imprint of the equation of state on the in-spiral waveform. So if you have no tides, uh, the distance between the stars decreases at a rate determined by the energy loss to gravitational waves. Uh, and that's, so you have an orbital energy that looks like uh, m squared over the distance between the stars for Newtonian orbital energy over here. And the fact that it's proportional to one over the distance means that uh, e dot over e uh, is equal up to assigned to d dot over d. So e is going to uh, represent the magnitude of the uh, orbital energy. Well, as the distance between the stars decreases during the in spiral, as they radiate energy in gravitational waves, the stars get closer together, the height of the tides de increases. And the tidal distortion of each star increases the total quadrupole moment of the orbiting stars. In fact, the tides increase the rate at which the orbit loses energy in two ways. First, there's this enhanced gravitational waves from the larger quadrupole moment. But there's also the direct energy loss, the work done in stellar deformation, in pulling the tides up in the stars. So these two effects mean that the orbit shrinks faster in stars with large radii, stars with larger tides. And the way you see that is a frequency that increases more quickly. As the stars spiral in, you hear the chirp, but you hear the chirp increasing its frequency more rapidly. The second way you th see this is that the tidal disruption at the end of the in spiral is larger. So the in spiral itself is ends when the stars are tidally disrupted and merge. 
that tidal disruption occurs at larger radius and therefore at lower frequency when you've got a larger star, when the tidal, when the tidal forces are larger. Uh, well, when the tidal deformation is larger. And so the in-spiral ends sooner at a cutoff frequency that's lower. So the two results, the frequency increasing more quickly during the in-spiral and tidal disruption at and a cutoff frequency uh, sooner at lower frequency. Well, here we've got stars ranging from 14 and a half kilometers down to 11 kilometers. And you can already see the 14 kilometer star starting to merge, the 13 and a half merging in orbit later, two orbits later for 12 and a half, and the 11 kilometer is still going at three orbits and finally merging. So a clear difference depending on the radius of the star within the uncertainty in neutron star radii. The difference is then formally related to what's called the deformability of the star. For an imposed external quadrupole field, the tidal field of the companion, the star acquires a quadrupole moment. So the magnitude of the external quadrupole field, that's what I'm calling E here, uh, is proportional to the induced quadrupole moment, constant of proportionality lambda, so a large lambda corresponds to a large star, a star with large radius. And we'll see that lambda increases very rapidly with radius, like r to the fifth, or if you include the effect of the, uh, an additional effect of the equation of state, like r to the sixth. The tidal effect on the in-spiral waveform then effectively measures the neutron star radius. That's the key dependence here. Well, the next calculation, our next back of the envelope calculation is to estimate this tidal in imprint, the size and the dependence of the tidal imprint on the radius and the distance between the stars. And we'll see that it goes like radius over distance to the fifth power. So the first thing, uh, Maybe a calculation familiar to you by looking at the tides raised by the moon and the sun. The height of the tide looks like the radius of the object times r over d cubed with d the distance between the objects. So we'll quickly get that. And then from that, we can easily get the change in the quadrupole moment and deduce the change in the radiated power that comes from this change in the quadrupole moment. So going like r over d to the fifth, that'll be our key equation, tells you that the change is small when, this, when they're far apart, uh, large only in the last 10 orbits or so, uh, and highly sensitive to the radius. So height of the tide, we get this from conservation of energy in a rotating frame or for asking how much work does the tidal force have to do to raise the tide? Uh, so height of the tide, you distort the star into an ellipsoid, the quadrupole form of the star. So the matter that was up here, in effect, is moved over here, raising it from the radius of the star here uh, by a height h on this side. So you take this piece and raise it a height h above where it was. Notice that the area of this matter that you raise looks like r squared. The height is h. So the volume is h over r times the volume of the star. And that's what the mass of this little piece is. OK, so the height h of the star of the deformation. You've moved these blue arcs to this red arc, raising them a height h. And in the tidal field of the companion, you're moving them by a distance r. So the energy gained by rising a height h in the parent star's field has to be the energy lost by falling the distance r in the other star's tidal field. 
Uh, the tidal force looks like m squared over d distance cubed times the radius. The work it's done is tidal force times distance moved. And similarly, the work done uh, against the parent star, that's the ordinary gravitational force, m delta m over r squared, and you're raising it a height h. So we just note that m delta m cancels out in both cases, and all we do is solve for h. So h looks like r to the fourth over d cubed, and uh, there we are. Since delta m looks like uh, m times h over r h over r, the volume of the little piece is h over r times the overall volume. The mass is h over r times the overall mass. So the change in mass is r cubed over d cubed. Well, the change in the quadrupole moment is now simple. We just, this is just parallel axis theorem. We have the old quadrupole moment that would be the result of two spherical stars or two point masses at a distance d, just md squared. And the change in the quadrupole moment is that, so the, the old quadrupole moment, the new quadrupole moment is that plus the quadrupole moment of this star at its center. So that's parallel axis theorem. Quadrupole moment is the trace-free part of the moment of inertia tensor or the mass moment tensor. So that's the part that comes from the ellipsoidal deformation, uh, delta m times r squared, the quadrupole moment about its parent center of mass. So quadrupole moment, change in quadrupole moment, and so we have a fractional change looking like delta m over m. That was the h cubed over d cubed times r squared over d squared, and that then is our r to the fifth over d to the fifth. So we'll say that again in another slide, but first let's see what that means. The gravitational wave power is the famous quadrupole formula, proportional to q triple dot squared. So a fifth q triple dot squared in gravitational units. Each dot brings down an angular uh, velocity or twice the angular velocity for the frequency of the wave. So we have q squared times omega to the sixth for q triple dot squared. The, so that's the rate of energy loss uh, and now we can look at the change in that rate that comes from the change in the quadrupole moment. So the change in Q squared is 2Q delta Q, and we have delta E dot over E dot is then 2 delta Q over Q. Well, we just saw that this deformation gave you a delta Q that looked like delta M times R squared with delta Q over Q looking like R to the fifth over D to the fifth, uh, and that that then tells us that delta E gravitational wave, the change in the rate at which the system loses energy, looks like R to the fifth over D to the fifth. So that is the heart of the key calculation for the imprint of gravitational waves on the in-spiral waveform. Well, we've seen that measuring the tidal deformability is equivalent to measuring the radius within current gravitational wave observational error. The ligo virgo analysis limited this deformability and thereby limited the radius, the fifth root of the deformability, to between 9 and 14 kilometers at 90% probability. So that's not a very tight limit. The optical limits are still significantly stronger, maybe 11 to 13, 11 to 13 and a half. But the more dramatic implication of the observation came from the post-merger. <laughs> and what it tells you about the maximum mass of the neutron star uh, and the high density equation of state from the fact that there was an observed delay in the collapse to form a black hole. <laughs> Matter uh, emerging from the collision after uh, the merger itself. 
So prior to this collision, we have an upper limit. And uh, we know that the neutron star upper mass limit is above the largest observed neutron star mass. And the largest seen electromagnetically is by Cromartiol in 2019 and a couple of other very close observations uh, of these three neutron stars here uh, with masses very close to two solar masses. So this guy is probably about 2.1, 2.15 solar masses. Uh, the upper mass limit is uh, at least this large, and we'll see that it's not much larger than this. So we've just about detected stars to within their upper mass limit. Uh, okay, so how does the argument go? Well, here's this merger, and the outcome of the merger depends on how large the mass of these neutron stars is. If you've got a mass that's too large, say larger than three solar masses or so, it's larger than the threshold for prompt collapse. The neutron star can't, a hot differentially rotating neutron star can't support itself against collapse. So this is a hypermassive neutron star, so massive that differential, the maximum amount of differential rotation you get from the coalescence and from the, the thermal pressure from the heat of the coalescence are together not large enough to keep it from immediate collapse and you get to a black hole or a black hole with a disk. On the other hand, if the mass is less than this threshold mass, then you have a neutron star that's temporarily sustained against collapse by its thermal pressure and its differential rotation for a few seconds until the increase in the magnetic field and effective viscosity turn the differential rotation into uniform rotation. And at that point, after a second or two, it then, uh, uh, so a supermassive star, too massive to be sustained uh, against collapse by uniform rotation. So when the differential rotation goes to uniform, it then collapses. And from the observation, that's what we're looking at. You got a, you got a collapse, but it took a couple of seconds uh, the last alternative is for a mass less than the maximum mass sustained by uniform rotation. So these three alternatives, we just went through them and we're looking at this one with maximum mass for a hot differentially rotating star greater than what we were looking at and that in turn greater than the maximum mass for uniform rotation. Well, <clears throat> we get now a lower bound on what that maximum mass has to be by looking at the mass of the remnant and then doing a, a fairly simple simulation to see what that implies for spherical cold stars. So the total mass uh, observed by LIGO has a secure uh, lower bound of 2.73 solar masses. You started off with this much mass in the in-spiraling stars. The mass of the ejected material from looking at observations and then doing simulations is less than about uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.08 solar masses. Uh, and that means that if you subtract this, you're left with a remnant that has a mass of at least 2.65 solar masses. The fact that there is no prompt collapse means that the maximum mass that can be supported by differential rotation and thermal pressure is greater than 2.65 solar masses. All right, well, now you have to do simulations of rotating stellar models to find out what the threshold mass this large is. So you start with a star with an equation of state for the cold star, and then you add thermal pressure and differential rotation to the model, and you find that the maximum mass of 2.65 solar masses corresponds to a stellar model with a 2.15 or larger uh, maximum mass for that cold spherical model. So the maximum mass then is greater than 2.15. 
But at the same time, we can get an upper bound on the maximum mass here more securely without, uh, without worrying about thermal pressure or whatever modeling we needed over here to figure out that only 0.08 solar masses was ejected. Uh, we already know that the maximum mass from observation is greater than 2.1, and we can get an upper bound on that maximum mass simply by saying that the maximum mass for uniform rotation uh, is 20% larger than the maximum mass of a spherical star. Well, this is, here there's no, there's no real modeling. You just take the cold equation of state, you, you look at a uniform density, uniform density, not, at a uniformly rotating star with that equation of state, this is an easy calculation. It can be done very precisely. And the maximum mass for uniform rotation is limited to 1.2 times the mass maximum mass for the spherical star. Well, we know that the maximum mass of the spherical star uh, then has to be less than our 2.73 starting mass, even if you eject no matter at all, divided by 1.2, and that's already 2.28 solar masses. So here, an essentially rigorous to within the LIGO, uh, the stringent error bars of LIGO, we're below 2.3 solar masses. And if you put in, if you just stuck in this 0.08 solar mass for the ejected material, you'd be down to 2.2 solar masses with fair security. So we've got a maximum mass now from our in-spiral observation that's restricted to between about 2.15 to 2.28 solar masses, a very tight bound on the maximum mass of a spherical star. Uh, more stringent bounds with uh, more model dependence uh, and equations of state at high density then ruled out by a 2.15 solar mass neutron star. So all of these gray equations of state represented the candidate equations of state prior to these high mass observations. Uh, anything with a phase transition in the core, hyperons, quark cores, pion, kn condensates, all increasingly unlikely. The candidates ruled out, uh, but of course the uh, theoreticians can come up, can change their parameters, come up with increasing difficulty with equations of state that can still accommodate hyperons or quark cores. Uh, finally, I have another minute and a half or maybe three minutes from the, for the 45 minutes since the end of the introduction and I'm gonna use them. Uh, so there's a last piece of this from a more recent observation uh, by LIGO since the merger of the two neutron stars. Well, there've really been two, two mergers. Uh, interesting from what we've been looking at. One of them of a, 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 a new, of an object that's in what's called the mass gap. So observed black holes have masses greater than about five solar masses. Neutron stars have masses less than 2.3 solar masses as we've seen. Uh, and so that leaves this gap in the observed stars. These are LIGO observed black holes. These are electromagnetically observed black holes where you can measure the mass. These are neutron stars whose mass you can measure and LIGO's neutron stars. There have been now a second event, one with the initial starting mass of just a little over two solar masses. Uh, and then uh, this event in uh, August of 2019, last year, uh, here you can see a chirp in Hanford and Livingston uh, of the largest mass ratio that's been seen by LIGO. A black hole with a mass between 22 and 25 solar masses and some object with a mass between 2.5 and 2.7 solar masses for the companion. So this is weird. An object in the gap, uh, what we've seen is this. So you have this starting object some, with a mass somewhere in here, 
securely in the mass gap, merging with a small with a large mass black hole, 22 solar masses, and forming a slightly larger black hole. So what is this? Well, these other two merging neutron stars we saw, both of them merged to form black holes within this mass gap. And there's another recent electromagnetic observation that might be within the mass gap. So black holes from neutron star mergers in the gap we might be seeing hierarchical binaries with one member the remnant of a past merger, but uh, there had already been some doubt from error bars in the mass measurements, and it's not really clear from theory whether you might, from isolated stars, form black holes occasionally that lie in the mass gap. Okay, so that's the conclusions of uh, what we've got over here, and uh, be happy to take questions. Uh, on anything or on uh, if people are interested uh, on uh, our process elements formed in the uh, in the merger. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we thank you, Professor Friedman, for this wonderful talk. And first of all, I would like to ask everybody to turn on their microphones to a round of applause in acknowledgement for this. <laughs> Uh, well, so normally uh, I, I give uh, uh, we have a, a question here in the in the chat, but before that, let me give you uh, uh, an overview of the audience that you had. So uh, you asked me in the start. So uh, we have people here from several different states uh, in Brazil, Para, obviously that here uh, where we are organizing, I'll mention the cities later on, but uh, we have also people from other regions of Brazil, like the Northeast, the Southeast, and the South region of Brazil, to mention some states like Piauí, Pernambuco, Rio Grande do Norte, Rio de Janeiro, Minas Gerais, São Paulo, Santa Catarina. Obviously, uh, we have students, postdocs, teachers, and professors from our own graduate program in physics, like uh, Professor Danilo Alves and Jorge Castilheiras. Uh, we have people from physics, but also from other related areas like geophysics, like uh, uh, Professor Cicero Regis from the Department of Geophysics of Pará University. Uh, we have uh, people from other cities uh, from Pará State, not only from Belém, but from Abaitetuba, Castanhal, and Capitão Poço, among others. And we have uh, uh, undergraduate students, graduate students, postdocs, teachers, and professors from universities and institutes from all around Brazil, just to mention some of them. Beatriz uh, Sifert from uh, Rio de Janeiro, Cecilia Quirenti from uh, Sao Paulo, Edson Moreira from Itajubá, Felipe Faria from Piauí, Jorge Matzas from uh, Sao Paulo, Maurício Coutinho from Pernambuco, Odilio Aguiar from INPE, in São José dos Campos, Raíssa Mendes from Niterói, Satis Kuma, VH from UniRio, Sérgio Joraz from Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and also some people from abroad, from abroad like uh, David Guerra from University of Valencia in Spain, uh, uh, Costas Cocotas from University of Tübingen in, in Germany, uh, Ronaldo Lobato from Texas uh, University in the United States. So uh, it's really a, a very uh, selected audience. So, and I thank everybody for being here. So uh, the first question come from uh, Satish Kuma, VH. Satish, uh, do you want to make the question yourself or do you want me to do it for you? Uh, thank you, Luis. I, I think that question has been answered already. They seem to be considering both uh, uniform rotation and differential rotation, right? So my question is, uh, Professor Friedman, do you consider when you, uh, I, I think obviously yes, um, uh, when you consider the uniform rotation, you are considering neutron star as a rigid body, right? Yes. Well, right. Uniform rotation is rotating as a rigid body. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, 
so you answered the question after i asked this thing that's fine so i have another question quick question um we observed one more uh, binary neutron star merger last year right but we don't yeah. seem to know what's the remnant uh, why is that a problem uh why is it a problem i'm not sure yeah, why, why 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 don't we know what the remnant is oh well the the pro i see the reason the reason you can't you can't tell from observation is that uh, the system was too far away to see uh, any electromagnetic signal. So the way you figured out what the remnant was, I mean, you, you saw the, you saw the uh, change in the signal after collapse and you saw the, uh, 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 you saw a, emission from well an ejection of matter in the nearby in 1708-17 where you had the electromagnetic counterpart you could see uh matter uh, you could see light from matter that was ejected uh from the star by winds after the coalescence so most of the matter was not promptly ejected matter from the collision itself but from wind uh, from the star after the uh, uh, coalescence occurred, and that told you you had this delayed collapse, uh, and then that stopped and you had a final collapse. But in this case, you saw no electromagnetic counterpart. So uh, the presumption is, I mean, you're, you're well over the uh, upper mass limit for neutron stars, so it must have collapsed to a black hole, but you have no counterpart. What's the fundamental physics that goes into this mass gap? It, it seems very arbitrary. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, so there's fundamental physics that, that cuts off the neutron star mass, of course. But what Everything it, else is black hole. What, what prevents, what prevents uh, you know, what it is that prevents a 20 solar mass initial star, you know, a, a, mm -hmm. a, a main sequence star that starts out at 20 solar masses, it's going to shed most of its mass before it becomes a black hole in any case. And so the question is, at what point do you, do you get a cutoff at all, or do you just end up with black holes going down all the way to about neutron star masses? And I don't think there's any, I think the point is, you can't do the theory well enough to, uh, to figure that out. Uh, so you rely on observations, and uh, and it's not even clear that the observations are good enough to for this gap to be real. So I presented it because it's interesting. You you see the gap; it's a mis it's mysterious. Uh, so it may well be that the physics prevents a cutoff. The physics actually creates a cutoff in isolated stars, and you can't get masses below four or five solar masses, but we don't know that. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Satish, for your questions, and, and thank you, Professor Friedman, for your answers. So uh, if you want to make questions and you don't want to write it down, just uh, write, I have a question, then, then you can make the question yourself, okay? So, but before that, uh, Professor, uh, do you know, uh, I mean, is there a telescope uh, uh, that, aims especially or is in it it main aims uh uh to to look for uh, uh neutron stars i mean especially i mean because i mean there is this gap there is this right astonishing gap and then uh, uh so is there a, a project of, of building uh, uh, an observation system to try to find more neutron stars like to to look for a survey in the sky or something like that uh well, there are continuing surveys from uh, uh, radio telescopes. There is a there's a large Australian project. This uh, well, currently the ASCAP, but what will be the Square Kilometer Array in Australia, uh, which is designed to do a large survey of neutron stars. The uh, uh, so the key targets there. Uh, among the key targets are stars that uh, rotate rapidly and are very stable that you can use to add to the 
system of uh, uh, time of carefully timed neutron stars to look for uh, long wavelength gravitational waves from the uh, pulsar timing array. So that's part of this square kilometer array, but it, in general, it's it'll do a survey of neutron stars. So continuing surveys, uh, but uh, and then always hope that you find unusual objects. So so certainly the the discoveries that uh, that are the most interesting are these stars coming once every five years or so near that are near this upper limit of two plus solar masses. So that's that exhausts my knowledge of, of the of the answer to that. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Cecilia Chirenti, uh, you have a question, right? So please go ahead. Um, hello, Professor Friedman, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Thank you. Just uh, trying to scroll up here so I can see you too. Uh, <laughs> there you are. Okay. Hi. Hi. My question is about the inversion scheme proposed by Lee Lindblom to go from mass and radius to P of rho, so from mass and radius to the equation of state. And mm -hmm. uh, that inversion scheme, I find it fascinating from a mathematical point of view. I think it's really interesting, but it might be very hard to implement when putting together different types of observations with their uncertainties. Is that yeah, with different, right, different, different, uh, <laughs> exactly. So you have, you have, right, different systematic uncertainties and then uh, different statistical uncertainties. Uh, right. so, so, so it's an interesting problem how you combine them. But, yeah, I, yeah, I wonder if you could comment about, uh, I don't know, how, or why you would favor the inversion scheme when compared with, say, um, uh, a Bayesian model, model comparison between different models of equation of state, for example? Uh, so, well, what would you do? Would you, uh, you, well, I think if you just take different, let's see, different models of the equation of state, then you're I mean, that would seem to, using different models would seem to me to kind of bias it because you're, it's whatever models you happen to pick out rather than a uniform, uh, a kind of uniform probability assigned to the equation of state space. So that seems a little, that seems a little strange to me. But, right. uh, but considering the... But I, I mean, I think, you know, you, you would want to do it by Bayesian analysis, but I, I'm not... Uh, for the parameter estimation and the posterior distribution. Yeah. The so the question is, do you do you draw the parameters from, uh, say, Lindblom's, you know, Lindblom's or the Lindblom index set of parameters for uh, the equation of state space, which are really uh, parameters for their uh, uh, different free functions, their spectral functions. Uh, Chebyshev polynomials, or whatever you want to use, uh, or do you do you have some more physical? Do you use more physical parameters instead, and try to uh, try to constrain physical parameters in the equation of state, uh, say in the Lagrangian by by uh, using the thing? And I don't. I think those are. I think those are kind of complementary approaches. So I would think of those two as plausible alternatives. But uh, you may well be more, I haven't done this. You, you may be you know, more expert and have a better understanding than I do of, uh, of this. Oh, but, uh, thanks for your comment. Thanks for your answer. Yeah. So thank you very much, Cecilia, for your question. Professor Friedman, for, for your answer. Uh, we have a question uh, from uh, Professor Cicero Regis that belongs to the graduate program of geophysics of Para University. He asked me to read it for you. So, is there an estimate for the probability of a neut neutron star merger happening inside our Milky Way? And if so, what will be the implications of measuring such a signal? 
<laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, okay. So the answer is uh, yes, there is a, an estimate for the probability of uh, neutron star mergers. Uh, uh, so the, uh, so let's see if we have it here. The, uh, given the distance to the closest merger at 40 megaparsecs, uh, we have a volume per merger per year of 10 to the fifth cubic, cubic megaparsecs. So the merger rate per galaxy is about uh, uh, 10 to the minus four per Milky Way equivalent galaxies per year. So if you wait for the next 10,000 years, uh, you are likely to see one. Uh, did you did you hear that? I or is there a yes, problem? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, thank you, Cicero, for your question. Thank you, Professor uh, John Friedman, for your answer. We have another question. Uh, this one comes from Rio de Janeiro, Niterói, from uh, uh, Raíssa Pessoa Mendes. Uh, she asked me to do the question because she has a baby, and and it may be noisy there. <laughs> So, <laughs> Professor Friedman, thank you uh, uh, for the excellent talk. Uh, so, determining the neutron star equation of state is definitely a main scientific goal for the next years. Can you comment a bit on the com complementarity of different observations, electromagnetic from the experiments like NICER, uh, gravitational waves, etc., for this purpose? Which, in your opinion, will give the strongest constraints? Uh, yeah, so I think the, the complementarity comes from the fact that uh, the electromagnetic observations all have some model dependence to them. Uh, so the precision is higher than the gravitational wave observations. And I think that is likely to continue to be true. Uh, you'll need a lot of gravitational wave observations of nearby stars coalesce, nearby in the sense of uh, uh, 100 to 150 million light years away before you can uh, improve the precision of the gravitational wave measurement, but it's relatively model independent. So it serves as a kind of reality check on the models for the electromagnetic observations. So I think there, I think it's the, I think the electromagnetic observations, as I said, though, I think are likely to dominate the precision of the uh, radius measurement uh, for stars in the range of 1.4 solar masses. Okay, so uh, thank you, Haisa, for your question. Uh, thank you, Professor Friedman, for your answer. So, Professor, uh, we're coming uh, uh, to the end. Uh, maybe if you want to leave your final comments and maybe talk about what you think are the, the major challenges uh, uh, for uh, neutron star science. Uh, okay, well, let me talk about it just within the uh, context of gravitational waves. The, so what I, what I didn't mention here are possible future observations. And a, a, key, a key observation uh, in the post-merger uh, is to see the oscillations of neutron stars, something that is probably beyond uh, our cap probably beyond our capability for uh, uh, for the current generation of uh, detectors, uh, but for the proposed Einstein telescope for third generation detectors, and possibly for enhanced uh, the enhanced detectors here in the next in a shorter period of time. Uh, one should be able to see these oscillations, and those oscillations uh, give you several parameters. So you're getting more than a single parameter in the equation of state. You get stronger constraints, and uh, 
uh, I see that as, and then you get a higher, much higher signal to noise for uh, more distant uh, neutron star, neutron star mergers. So I see all of those things as being uh, uh, helpful in constraining the, uh, uh, the high density part of the equation of state. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, so, Ojiro Aguiar from a National Institute of Space Research in uh, uh, São José dos Campos uh, uh, raised the hand. Odilio, do you want to make the question yourself? Uh, yes, uh, please. Uh, I, I would like to just make a comment. Uh, those objects inside the mass gap with masses of 2.8, 3.4 solar masses produced by the two neutron stars binary mergers and also by the LIGO-Virgo collaborations. Those were uh, GW-1708-17 and GW-1904-25. Uh, they could not be detected, Professor, because their gravitational wave signal was above, uh, above two kilohertz, was too weak uh, to reveal the nature of the final objects. If they, were, if they have been closer or for a better sensitivity, gravitational waves, detectors like Einstein telescope or cosmic explorer, they, they could maybe be uh, a reveal. I mean, their nature could be revealed. Thank so you. So a problem of gravitational wave signal. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you very much, Odilio, for your comment. Uh, thank you very much, Professor John Friedman. Uh, and uh, uh, before we finish, I would like uh, to ask again everybody to turn on their microphones for a, a, a final round of applause in acknowledgement to this uh, wonderful moment that we have learned with Professor John Friedman about neutron stars. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.